Good morning. The Golden Gate Bridge. How many of you have driven across it? Quite a few. How about walked across it? A whole different type of deal, right? It's really, really cool. My name's Kevin Briggs. Good morning. For over 23 years, I was with the California Highway Patrol, and part of my responsibility, both as an officer and a supervisor, was to patrol and handle the calls on that bridge. It was a fantastic place to work. I felt blessed to do it. But the bridge also had a very, very dark and ominous side. It's the number one place in the United States for suicide. I'd like to share one of my encounters with you. This is Jason Garber. I met Jason on July 22nd of 2013. Jason had flown out to the bridge on three occasions, three times, this being his third, from New Jersey where he lived with his parents. Jason was mid-span on the bridge over the rail sitting on what we refer to as the cord, C-H-O-R-D. It's like an I-beam on the other side of that four-foot rail. When I got to the scene, I was the first CHP officer. I was the on-duty supervisor, but the officers were busy. I responded, there's Jason sitting on the cord. A Golden Gate Bridge security guard was already speaking with Jason. For the next half hour or so, we interchanged and spoke quite a bit about Jason, what has been going on with him. And all he did was straddle that cord sitting on it. He talked about his family life. Everything was good, but he felt he was a burden to his family. We see this almost every time someone's over that rail. He had suffered for years from mental illness, number two. And number three, he had been prescribed medication, which he stopped. Those three things we see all the time. So we kept speaking with Jason, trying to find out what was it that he flew out for today? Why today? He was a very, very accomplished 32-year-old man, college graduate, um, articulate. He was a poet, a writer, a really, really neat guy. Now, during this time, if you've ever been to the bridge in the summer months, it gets quite cold. It's the foggy time, so it's, it gets nasty out there. This was getting towards the evening, getting very cold, and Jason was not wearing a jacket. For me, I want to be like them. It's part of the empathy thing and to empower them. So I'm not wearing my jacket, and it was cold, and it was cold, and I'm shaking, and he's shaking. The Golden Gate Bridge officer gave Jason his duty jacket at about 45 minutes into this. We talked for 10 minutes more or so. Jason said, do, uh, do we know the story of Pandora's box? Yes, yes we do, Jason. Pandora opens a box, which she was not to, never told to, to open from Zeus, and out flies all sorts of plagues, evils, sorrows against man. Now, when Jason says, when I open that box, hope, is the greatest evil. And that was the only thing that was in that box that was good. That's how profound that he was. At that point, he gave the jacket back to the Golden Gate Bridge security guard. The security officer tried to grab Jason, which we really don't do, but this was a last shot ditch effort kind of thing. He was tearing up, the security officer. I thought we were in the middle of this and still going good. Jason sitting on that cord, went erect with his back, I saw a tear come down his eye because I was right here looking down at him sideways. And he just leaned to his right and he was gone. 220 feet down, about 75 miles an hour, he hits the water. Devastated us. We know going into this that we can lose some, but we try our damnedest. It is very, very difficult for us to, to, to lose someone. So I'm standing there, I thought we were in the middle of this but it, he went and Coast Guard picks him up and takes him back. I'm standing there making sure that my officers are still okay. They hold the pedestrians back so they can't come up. A gentleman comes running up to me. He goes, officer, there's a body in the water. Highly emotional, me, because of what just occurred. I'm not gonna tell you what I said, but it wasn't very friendly. 
And he goes, no, another one. So while we're in the middle of the bridge, we're dealing with Jason, a gentleman up at the North Tower jumped at almost the same time. I went up there, we lost that body. That body went, um, we, we lost it. It was run over by a huge container ship. We lost that individual. An hour and a half prior to all of this, another individual had jumped off that bridge. Three lives lost that day, three officers affected. And I want to say, um, very, very tough. Besides that, now it just spreads out. We talk about this ripple effect going through the families. For me, it's a tsunami. It destroys families. I've seen it time and time again. This really messes us up. I went home that night, thinking that whole night, very little sleep, thinking, what could I have done different? We know way deep, deep, deep down that this is, to us, it's like an end stage cancer. This is, you know, when they get to that level, it's tough, it's very tough. Most of the time, we can get them back over. Sometimes we don't, and it, it, it uh, we kind of blame ourselves. It's not just me, it's other officers also. This is Angie Cost, 20 year plus veteran with the California Highway Patrol. She rides a bicycle on the Golden Gate Bridge. In January of 2013, she encountered a woman by herself walking on the bridge who appeared despondent. She contacted the woman and the woman was angry with Angie. Didn't want to give her any information, didn't really want to talk to her. Why are you bothering me? Why are you hassling me? And he said, okay. Angie did not feel she had enough to detain this woman. So Angie started riding away, traveling um, northbound on the sidewalk. Now, as she progressed, Angie thought about this for a while and said, this isn't setting right with me. She turned around, rode back to that young woman, contacted her again. Young woman got angry and said, you know what, I've had it, I'm walking off the bridge, I'm leaving. Angie said, okay. Angie is following behind her on her bicycle, walking behind her. As you can see, if you can, there's by the uh, pedestrian rail over here, there's a large fence right here. That's because of, of uh, the water below it. We don't want people jumping off. Now, prior to the barrier going, that's going to go up, you can see everything from here. What happened was Angie contacted the woman here. They're walking back this way where that arrow is. There's no fence there. This young lady went whoosh, right over that, right in front of Angie. And there's no barrier there because that is over land. And that young woman hit land. I was the on-duty supervisor. I went down and Angie, at the, that's the south end of the bridge. We have a trailer down there where we do reports and things. Angie's in that trailer. I go in, I shut the door. The second I shut that door, she just breaks down crying. Any of us would, it's not a, a female thing or anything like that, it's a human thing. She felt, as I do, we lost this, it's our fault. She goes, I always put my bicycle in between them and walk them off. This time I didn't do it. And this is what happened. I told her to go home, she didn't want to. She wanted to continue working. She did, but she went home that evening. I followed up with her, called her on her days off, and she was having a very, very tough time. She wasn't sleeping. She had this preoccupation with this event. All these things that we talk about for compassion fatigue. This is what was going on with her. So what is compassion fatigue? Really, it's all these events, this cumulative thing, all these things that we see starting to affect us in a very undesirable way. And it does this throughout your whole system, your essence. Everything about you can go down. What we do is Angie went through the employee assistance program and got some help. And because we allowed her to do that, she's back on the bridge doing what she loves to do. But these things can really, really take a toll on us. I've developed 
a model called my critical response model. It's called the release model to help folks in talking to someone who may be in crisis. Most of us can see when one of our peers or something may be struggling. What do we do with that? Can we recognize when they're hurting? When they keep talking about a certain event? When they come to work but they're not really there, the presenteeism, absenteeism, alcohol or substance abuse. We have a choice. Are we gonna take the path of none of my business, they're a professional, they should handle it? Are we gonna confront them head on and say, hey, I'm seeing these things. What's going on? Let's talk. Or do we take the path of, I'm not going to handle it. I saw these things going on. Then that person lost their life to suicide. Well, I saw those things, but I didn't think they, they would do anything because they're a professional. We have choices. My big mantra is, of course, make that choice. We're going to face this head on. And listen. Listen to understand. That's the key. Listen to understand. We speak at about 150 words a minute, can listen up to about 450. What are we doing with all that extra time? Our mind can wander. We really need to see what's going on with these folks. I really like this picture because even though that table is there, they're at the corner where they can be together. There's not a separation as like a desk. There's no barrier there. I really like that to be right there with that individual, making a plan. Empathy. Put yourself in their shoes. Working on that bridge, we see a lot. I'll be working with someone over that rail, sitting over that rail. Traffic all starts backing up, traffic going northbound back into Marin because these folks want to go home. It's five, six, seven in the, in the evening. And what happens? Because somebody is four or five minutes late getting home, they roll down their window as they come by and they yell out, jump you SOB, thank you. As a negotiator, all that time, 20 minutes up to eight hours, that I've been developing rapport, trying to help this individual, is now shot because of this guy. Imagine if it was his family member up there. Empathy is huge. Accepting the person for who they are. We may not think that they've been through a lot. I've had cancer, I had three heart surgeries, traumatic brain injuries, a divorce where my ex-wife wrote suicide notes to my kids, a 15-year-old that was suicidal last year. That's a lot of stuff. But I don't talk about that when I'm with someone over that rail because it's not about Kevin Briggs. It is never the Kevin Briggs show. It's about them, accepting them for who they are. Maybe it's just one thing that they have and they find themselves over that rail. It doesn't matter. We need to help them. Supporting them. I'm worried about you. I care about you. You have my phone number. You can call me 24 hours a day. I may not be able to pick up right then, but I'll get to it as soon as I can. And other people will support you also. And encouraging them to seek assistance. Very, very important. Following up with them. This is my release model. I'll let you look at that for just a second here. So what about our own self-care? This is my quality of life triad, and it starts with self-care. It starts with me on the very top. That's important because it's up to me. Most of the time, I need to be able to pull up my own bootstraps, if at all possible. Being diagnosed with depression, taking medication for it, I've been able to do it. But I suffered greatly for a long time because I didn't realize this was happening to me. Self-compassion, self-care, knowing I may blow it, even on this type A cop, we're gonna mess up sometimes. I never have, but people have told me that might happen. <laughs> so, going to the gym. Uh, I do my, my ex-wife, my boys are, are uh, half Japanese. So I want them to retain that culture. It's very, very important to me. So we do Aikido when we can. It's a Japanese martial art. It's kind of a bonding thing, and they learn the Japanese language more. It's really neat stuff. I do TM, Transcendental Meditation, which has really helped me. 20 years ago, if someone would have said it, oh yeah, do meditation, I'd be out the door probably. I tried yoga, I didn't like it, not, not for me. Meditation really works though. This particular one, I don't know any others. This is really neat stuff. 
support system is crucial. Most of us in law enforcement, well, a lot of us in law enforcement don't rely on that very well. Right out of high school, I went to the United States Army, Airborne Infantry, got out of that after I had the cancer. I worked at San Quentin for some years, and then I did the Highway Patrol, these macho jobs where we never show a weakness. I didn't really have a support system. So after all this other stuff that happened, that depression set in and knocked me in the dirt. I didn't know what was going on. It was very, very tough, very, very tough. And the professional care, all these, so important. I'm not just talking psychiatrist, psychologist, anybody in profession that can help you out, anyone. My sensei, my instructor for Aikido, he's a professional, anyone. Life coach, gym instructor, they can help you out. All these make up that quality of life that's so important for us. Now let's go back to the bridge and focus not on the possible jumper, but on the professional. Even you, all of us in the case. This is me, but it can be anybody. If by chance I didn't take care of myself, I let this compassion, fatigue, vicarious trauma, these things build up, and I can't get to work being the trained negotiator, there's not gonna be a hand out there for that young man to grab onto. And on the bridge, that's 30 to 60 lives a year that we could lose. Each and every one of us can make a huge impact in other people's lives. We really can. But I ask you please to make some positive changes for yourself. Thank you very much.